This video is brought to you by Raycon. Earbuds with a great sound at a great price. Check them out at buyraycon.com forward slash biographics. More on them in just a bit. On September the 16th, 2015, CNN hosted a Republican debate as part of the lead-up to the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Despite the fact that he had been dead for more than 10 years, Ronald Reagan was mentioned during this event 63 times. The candidates themselves stood behind podiums in the shadow of Ronald Reagan's one-time presidential plane. That September stage was a powerful metaphor. Anyone who pays attention to American politics can tell you that the legacy of Ronald Reagan casts a long shadow. The Reagan presidency forced an indelible image of modern conservatism that will likely endure well into the 21st century. But the story of Ronald Reagan is much more than some straight line from noble birth to Republican iconography. It's a labyrinth path of career decisions that moves Reagan through Hollywood, the American Midwest, and eventually the White House. Even his political positions were non-linear. He's often thought of as a quintessential conservative, but the truth is, Reagan was rarely predictable. He rallied against big governments, but he also loved the New Deal, campaigned against Richard Nixon, and oversaw the largest gubernational tax increase in American history. The 40th president spent a lifetime accumulating nicknames. You can call him Rawhide, the Gipper, the Great Communicator, or even the Jelly Bean Man, but on today's episode of Biographics, We'll just call him Ronald Reagan. Like a lot of American presidents, Ronald Wilson Reagan was not born into wealth or power. He was born on February 5, 1911, in a small apartment in Tampico, Illinois. His mother, Nell Clyde Wilson, was a Scot and a devout Protestant. His father, Jack, was an Irish alcoholic who worked as a traveling salesman during Ron's teenage years. Ronald also had an older brother, Neil, who was two and a half years his elder. As a young child, the Reagans moved around a lot, with Jack in search of steady work. The family had stints in Chicago, Galesburg, and Monmouth before returning to Tampico after Ronald's eighth birthday. They lived above the H.C. Pitney Variety store, with Jack working downstairs in the store itself. Ronald's family eventually settled in Dixon, where he developed a reputation as a bit of a variety man himself. Ronald was naturally athletic and enjoyed playing football, but he also enjoyed time on the stage. In the 1920s, excelling at sports and theatre just meant you were a well-rounded young adult. Nowadays, such a combination is unlikely enough to prompt Disney movies that involve singing and dancing. Regardless, young Reagan was known as a multi-talented youth, even at a young age. He was a naturally gifted communicator who enjoyed telling stories. Stories. He also worked as a lifeguard on the Rock River in Lau Park, where he made more than 70 water rescues. At Eureka College, he continued his stage acting while also serving as captain of the swim team and the football team. He took an interest in campus politics, too, where his intelligence and gift of gab earned him the position of student council president. He graduated with a double major in sociology and economics. After completing his formal education, Reagan had to do that one thing that every jack of all trades must eventually do – narrow his interests down to just one career. He chose sports, taking a job as a radio announcer in Iowa in 1932. At first, he worked for several stations, but he eventually narrowed his focus to WHO Radio in Des Moines, offering play-by-play -play for Cubs games. His speciality became maintaining a consistent play-by-play -play narrative over the radio, despite the fact that he was receiving only basic information about the game via telegraph wire. Reagan stayed in sports throughout much of the 1930s, offering routine comfort to Midwestern baseball fans throughout the Great Depression. But in 1937, he was traveling in California with the Cubs during a West Coast swing and was offered the chance to do a screen test. Reagan, still the multi-talented man, took the offer, and it led to a seven-year contract with Warner Brothers. He appeared as the leading man in Love is on the Air later that year. His career in sports was quickly vaporized by the potential of the silver screen. Over the next two years, Reagan appeared in nearly two dozen films, including Dark Victory with Humphrey Bogart and Betty Davis. He also made a dramedy called Brother Rat with Jane Wyman in 1938 about cadets at the prestigious Virginia Military Institute. Two years later, Reagan and Wyman made a sequel called Brother Rat and a Baby, 
and the pair also got married. In 1940, he returned to his love of sports to play George Jip in a Newt Rock biopic, which gave him one of his more famous nicknames, The Jipper. An exhibition poll anointed him the fifth most popular young star of Hollywood in 1941. The following year, in 1942, Reagan received not his biggest role, but perhaps his most important. Two years prior, author Henry Bellman had written a book called King's Row that focused on the hypocrisy and mythology of life in the American Midwest, and it became a bestseller. The book was a adapted as a movie by Casey Robinson in 1942, with Reagan playing the role of Drake McHugh. Reagan's character isn't the lead, but he does have a key scene where he wakes up from a medical operation and a rogue surgeon has amputated both of his legs. Reagan frantically exclaims, where's the rest of me? And audiences ate it up. King's Row is often considered the highlight of Reagan's movie career. Warner Brothers tripled his salary to $3,000 a week, and he stood on the precipice of true Hollywood fame. Unfortunately, Reagan's career was about to be pushed in a completely different direction. Instead of being called up to Warner Brothers Studio for his next great table read, he was called to active duty military service on the 18th of April, 1942. Back in 1937, when he was still covering the Cubs, Ronald Reagan had enlisted in the Army Reserves. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Officers' Reserve Corps of the Cavalry, but was also classified as limited service due to his poor eyesight. When Reagan was called up to active duty, his eyesight kept him stateside and off the true battlefields. He was given a port liaison post in San Francisco. Almost immediately, Reagan applied for a transfer from the cavalry unit to the Army Air Force, which he stayed in for the remainder of the war. Reagan the Thespian was heavily utilized by motion picture units, first in California and later in New York, to create useful videos for the armed forces. He was involved in projects aimed at training, recruiting, and even fundraising. By the end of the war, his units had produced more than 400 videos for the Air Force, including cockpit simulations for bombing runs over the Japanese mainlands. He left active duty on December 9, 1945, having attained the rank of captain. After the war, Reagan returned to Hollywood, acting in a number of B-list war films and leaning ever so slightly into his dormant love for politics. He became third vice president of the Screen Actors Guild in 1946, while he was making movies like Stallion Road and The Voice of the Turtle. In 1947, much of the Guild was forced to resign over a conflict of interest, and Reagan was elected president of the Guild in a special election. He was re-elected six times, including every year from 1947 to 1951. Reagan led the Screen Actors Guild through a tumultuous time, but his tenure is generally considered a huge success for Hollywood. He helped secure residual pay for actors when their movies or television episodes were rerun. He also oversaw a handful of labor management disputes. This period of time was the beginning of the Hollywood blacklist era, when motion picture companies kept a growing list of actors and actresses they considered to be communist sympathizers and with whom they would refuse to work. Reagan was constantly asked to help identify communists or to help clear the name of someone who had been wrongly accused. For example, there's a well-documented case of a young actress who barely had her foot in the door in 1947, seeking help from Guild President Reagan to clear her good name. Both Reagan and his wife, Jane Wyman, cooperated with a number of FBI investigations regarding which Hollywood personalities might be hiding or even not hiding communist sympathies. He was given the code name T-10 and provided information to the U.S. government on several occasions. Reagan thought this was a good idea to a point. Like many Americans at the time, he believed that communism and its beliefs were antithetical to American democracy. However, Reagan also showed some level of disbelief at the extent of the finger-pointing that the FBI was asking him to do. At one point, Reagan allegedly mouthed off to his FBI handlers, asking, Do you expect us to constitute ourselves as a little FBI of our own and determine who is a commie and who isn't? As the 1940s were coming to a close, Ronald Reagan could feel his ambitions evolving again. He was still acting in film films and even began to consider adopting some television roles, but the career he was envisioning wasn't quite so film-focused. His experience with the Screen Actors Guild had given him a taste for what a real political career might feel like, and he started giving serious thought to statewide political involvement 
in California. Reagan's wife Jane was not nearly as enthusiastic about this potential career change. Ronald's involvement with the professional guild was one thing, but she did not want to be a politician's wife. His new aspirations became a major marital conflict in the late 1940s. There was another, much more somber source of tension between the Reagans, though. Jane had given birth to their first child, Maureen, in 1941, and the couple had adopted a son, Michael, in 1945. Jane was pregnant again in 1947, but her second biological child was born four months early and died after one day. By 1948, Jane Wyman had filed for divorce, citing her husband's growing political ambition, as well as his present-day distractions with the Screen Actors Guild, as the reasons for her dissatisfaction. There were also explicit ideological differences. Wyman was a Republican married to a Democratic political activist. Their separation was finalized in 1949. Reagan began campaigning for Democratic candidate Harry Truman during his re-election campaign in 1948. For American history buffs, this was the infamous Dewey defeats Truman campaign, where Truman had to win his own election after assuming the presidency following Franklin Roosevelt's death. Jack Reagan had been a staunch populist Democrat, imparting to his son the wisdom of trust busting, child labor laws, a minimum wage, and progressive tax plans. FDR had been an inspiration to Reagan throughout his entire adulthood, thus Truman was the obvious choice for Reagan. He appeared on stage with Truman during a Los Angeles rally. Despite erroneous reporting from the Chicago Daily Tribune, Reagan's men won big, defeating Republican favorite Thomas Dewey with 303 electoral votes to 189. Even while he continued to record films, Reagan joined in on a number of Democratic fights in the early 1950s. He opposed Republican right-to-work legislation. He also helped Helen Douglas in her Senate campaign against a California man by the name of Richard Nixon. Between his filmography, his Guild presidency, and his growing political portfolio, Ronald Reagan had become the most powerful Democrat in Hollywood. And just before we get into the rest of today's video, I do want to tell you about today's sponsor, Raycon. Raycon make great earbuds with a great sound at an affordable price point. They're all about innovative design at prices that just don't break the bank. They sent me a pair of these, the Everyday E25 earbuds. Let me just pop that in. And I've been using them for a couple of days. They fit easily in the ear. The Bluetooth connects amazingly easily because now I'm listening to a YouTube video I was watching on my phone. Um, so I'm going <laughs> to take that out. But uh, it's pretty great how easily they do just connect just like that. Plus, they come with this case which gives four charges. So you get six hours in the earbuds, recharge it four more times in this case. Now, I've used cheap earbuds, I've used expensive earbuds. But what Raycon do is they deliver a premium experience at about half the price of other premium wireless earbuds. So if you just go to buyraycon.com forward slash biographics, you'll get 15% off your order. And let's get back to today's video. Reagan's priorities began to change pretty dramatically again in the 1950s, but this time it wasn't his career aspirations that were evolving, it was his ideological ones. For one thing, Reagan began to feel comfortable with the idea of remarrying. Reagan was emotionally wrecked after his divorce from Jane Wyman, perhaps in part because he felt like her complaints about him were true. He had been consumed by his work with the Screen Actors Guild. Since his divorce, Reagan had met a woman he felt a deep connection with, but he wasn't prepared to retie the knot just yet. As for the woman that had caught Reagan's attention, well, remember our fearful guild member who had come to Reagan for help when the FBI was looking to make her as a communist? Well, her name was Nancy Davis, a lesser-known New York City transplant and small-time Hollywood actress. After Reagan's divorce, he finally gave in and remarried on the 4th of March 1952, realizing that she was the true love of his life. Nancy Davis retained her stage name for movie credits, but legally, she changed her name to Nancy Reagan. The couple had two children, Patricia Ann Reagan, who was born in October of 1952, and Robert Prescott Reagan, who was born in 1958. The far bigger diametric shift in Reagan's life was political. In 1954, with middle age setting in and his movie career dying down, Reagan took a job as the host of General Electric Theatre, a CBS anthology series that featured television adaptations of popular novels, short stories, movies, or plays. 
Reagan earns $125,000 a year, along with an even wider level of fame. The show topped out at number three in the Nielsen ratings in 1957. As part of his contractual duties as show host, Reagan was required to tour dozens of General Electric plants all across the country and talk with the workers. Reagan could speak as many as 14 or 15 times a day. Once a GE public relations liaison that worked alongside Reagan remarked that General Electric saturated him in middle America. As burdensome as the tours likely were for a national star like Reagan, they were also good practice. Reagan was always a gifted speaker, but his 10,000 hours of speaking to average Americans polished his oratory skills to elite levels. He would eventually be nicknamed the Great Communicator. Exposure to hundreds of factory workers also shifted his political ideology. Reagan still admired FDR, still believed in many of the populist principles that had been passed down by his father. But his time spent in factories and around factory workers began to refocus his attention on the benefits of business and the potential dangers of unchecked government growth. His metamorphosis continued into the 1960s when he was ready to formally change parties and jump headlong into politics. GE forbade Reagan from getting too politically involved while the host of a popular television program, fearing that it would inevitably alienate viewers. Reagan didn't disagree with their premise, so he left the show in 1962 and registered as a Republican. I didn't leave the Democratic Party, Reagan famously said. The party left me. Reagan the Republican jumped into the deep end of the pool very quickly. He opposed Medicare legislation, fearing that such a broad entitlement program was the first major domino to fall on the way to a socialist America. He also opposed the food stamp program, which was introduced around the same time and proposed a raise to the minimum wage. Reagan's policy positions were principled, but unsexy. He made a far bigger splash when he gave a high-profile speech advocating for presidential candidate Barry Goldwater in the run-up to the presidential election of 1964. His speech, A Time for Choosing, is a 27-minute masterclass in political speechmaking. Reagan smoothly weaves together anecdotes, jokes, and admonishments against big government. Whatever your political ideology, it's tough to watch the speech and not come away impressed by Reagan's polish. As narrator. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. Reagan's candidate, Barry Goldwater, was trounced by Lyndon Johnson, losing the Electoral College 486 to 52. But Reagan himself got a massive popularity bump from his national speaking engagement. One writer from the Washington Post called it the most successful national political debut since William Jennings Bryan. In 1964, it was completely unprecedented to jump from life as a TV star straight into the political arena, but that's exactly what Reagan had the cachet to do. So, in 1965, he announced that he would run for governor of California. Reagan was campaigning to replace Pat Brown, a two-term incumbent who had most recently defeated Richard Nixon in 1962. Nixon wasn't a true carpetbagger, as he was indeed from California, but he was running on the heels of eight years as Dwight Eisenhower's vice president, and he had little grasp of the state issues. Reagan proved to be a much tougher challenge for Brown. The Republican convert had campaigned on the promise to send the welfare bums back to work, among other matters. Brown had become unpopular after he went back on a promise not to run for a third term, then deepened his unpopularity problems during the election after he jokingly compared Reagan to another former actor, John Wilkes Booth. The result was a landslide victory for Reagan, who won nearly 58% of the vote. Don't cry too hard for Pat Brown, though. He finished his political career with a one-win, one-loss election record against future Republican presidents. And, well, that's not bad. Right out of the gate, Reagan was determined to balance the California state budget, so he froze hiring for state jobs. He also instituted the largest state tax increase in U.S. history. Included in his new tax plan were hikes on sales tax, cigarettes, alcohol inheritance, and anyone in the highest tax bracket of earners. Even beyond the budget, Reagan had a highly eventful two terms in office as the governor of California. After campaigning on the promise to clean up the mess at Berkeley, meaning anti-establishment student protests, he sent thousands of patrolmen and National Guard 
ground troops to the University of California to quell an ongoing civil conflict. The result was one student death and more than 100 injuries to officers in an incident known as Bloody Thursday. Reagan also fought a battle over death penalty legality with the state Supreme Court. He signed into law the Therapeutic Abortion Act, which was crafted to help stop dangerous backroom abortions. He approved the Family Law Act, which legalized no-fault divorces. When he left the California governor's mansion in 1972, it turned his focus to the White House. He had flirted with the nomination in 1968, positioning himself to receive attention while still early on in his first term as governor. Eight years later, he was ready to challenge a never-actually-elected president, Gerald Ford, in the Republican primary. The Republican Party needed to be steadied after Nixon's Watergate fiasco in the ensuing midterms, which had been understandably dominated by Democrats. Reagan believed that he was the man for the job, and he didn't mind challenging a sitting president. Reagan did give Ford a significant push, announcing his candidacy a full year before the election in November of 1975. Neither man was able to obtain the necessary 1,130 votes needed to win the nomination before the Republican convention. Feeling he needed a masterstroke to push him over the finish line, Reagan sought to appeal to the more moderate wing of the party, announcing the liberal Republican Richard Schweiker as his running mate. The move backfired. Very few moderates were actually swayed to Reagan's side, but he did alienate some of his more conservative base. Ford won his party's nomination, then lost in the general election to Jimmy Carter. Four years later, though, the nomination was Reagan's to lose. Reagan returned to his successful California strategy, attacking a swollen federal government that he believed had overspent, overstimulated, and overregulated. Carter, embroiled in a stagnant economy and an ongoing hostage crisis in Iran, was soundly beaten. Reagan carried 44 states and won the Electoral College 489 to 49. It was one of the largest U.S. electoral margins of victory ever, which Reagan promptly surpassed in 1984 when he beat Walter Mondale 525 to 13. U.S. history is filled with rich ironies, but few of them are richer than the dramatic conflict and climaxes of the actor-turned-president. Entire books have been written about the events and nuances of Reagan's administration, which saw an incredible tornado of events from 1981 to 1989. I couldn't begin to describe everything that happened across those eight years in just one section of one video. The Reader's Digest version, though? Well, assassins, guns, invasions, Olympics, economy, drugs, AIDS, armistice. See what I mean? Ronald Reagan's presidency in the 1980s sounds like an overstuffed script that he might have read for in the 1940s. So let's start with economics. The US economy improved so dramatically in the 1980s that supply-side economics is often referred to as Reaganomics. When Reagan took office, the economy was stagnant and inflation was at an all-time high for a peacetime US. His plan, alongside Arthur Laffer and other advisors, was to cut taxes across the board in all tax brackets. For example, at that time, the top tax bracket for high earners required a 70% tax. Reagan reduced the obligation to 50% over a three-year period. The US economy boomed through the 1980s, with growth hitting an annual rate of 7.9% over Reagan's eight years in office. Critics were quick to attribute the growth to other factors beyond the tax cuts, like FICA tax rate increases. They also pointed out that the robust economic health had done nothing to improve the federal deficit, which was exploding thanks to increased defense spending. But that defense spending was intentional. Reagan knew that years of space races and nuclear one-upmanship had tanked Soviet spreadsheets. By the 1980s, they were facing even more problems. Armed conflicts with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, massive agricultural and manufacturing inefficiencies from its planned economy, and by 1985, plummeting oil prices. Reagan intentionally planned to dramatically escalate U.S. defense spending even further to push the Soviets onto the brink of economic peril. His plan included an elaborate missile defense system that was literally called Star Wars. However, when he sensed pliability in Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, he adopted a more diplomatic approach. Reagan and Gorbachev eventually negotiated nuclear disarmament after a series of conversations, including a secret meeting in Iceland in October of 1986. Less than a year later, in Berlin, Reagan uttered his famous soundbite, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It directly led to the dismantling of the Soviet Union. 29 months later, Germans could freely pass through the border between the East and West states. 
All that isn't to say that there were no failures or problems during the Reagan presidency. 16 American soldiers died in 1983 when the US invaded Grenada following a coup. A bomb in the American barracks in Beirut killed 241 American servicemen during the Lebanese Civil War. More than 59,000 people died of AIDS during the Reagan presidency, which was completely unknown prior to his time in office, and which he didn't formally address until the final two years of his presidency. His wife Nancy helped enact a well-meaning anti-drug campaign called Just Say No, which was certainly well-meaning, but it failed to recognize many of the chemical and physiological nuances behind drug addiction. Still, Reagan's eight years as President of the United States is typically hailed as a meaningful, successful administration, even by non-conservatives. He set the American economy up for 25 years of fairly stable growth. He nominated Sandra Day O'Connor, the first ever female justice for the U.S. Supreme Court. He successfully navigated an air traffic controller strike that could have crippled North American logistics and transportation. He used his simple, clear style of communication to re-emphasize American values and foster a new sense of American patriotism. And to think, it was all almost derailed just two months into its short tenure when on March 30, 1981, a college dropout and failed artist John Hinckley Jr. attempted to assassinate Reagan. While other U.S. assassins often had political motivations, Hinckley Jr. had developed a pathological obsession with the actress Jodie Foster after watching the movie Taxi Driver, and he saw the assassination of a U.S. president as a brilliant plan to get her attention. So, after Reagan had addressed the AFL-CIO conference in Washington, DC, Hinckley discharged a 22 caliber revolver at him and his retinue, injuring four people. In the aftermath, press secretary James Brady was permanently disabled. Hinckley was tried, but ultimately found not guilty by reason of insanity. He called the assassination attempt the greatest love offering in the history of the world. His verdict prompted a reformation on criminal insanity pleas. As for the 40th president, Reagan made a full recovery after being struck by a bullet that ricocheted off the presidential limousine. He later told his adopted son Michael that he believed he had been spared by God to fulfill a higher purpose. Whether or not the Reagan presidency was directly sanctioned by God is an answer you'll have to find on another YouTube channel, but it's hard to argue that the Reagan presidency wasn't immensely consequential. Beyond a surging economy and the end of the Cold War, Reagan refocused American conservatives after decades of rudderless partisan challenges. He set the stage for 21st century American politics, coalescing mainstream conservatism around supply-side fiscal policies, small government principles, and individual responsibility. Reagan didn't lead much of a life after his presidency. When he was elected, he was already 69, which was the oldest president had ever been upon his inauguration. By the time he was succeeded by his vice president, George H. W. Bush, in 1989, he was nearing 80. By 1994, he had announced that he was suffering from Alzheimer's disease. From there, he kept his circle close as the disease progressed. He was only able to recognize his wife and a few other close friends. He died at home on June 5, 2004, at the age of 93. After his death, his body lay in repose at both his presidential library and in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol building. More than 200,000 people came to pay their respects, first in California, then in Washington, D.C. And that appears to be the enduring legacy of Ronald Reagan, now 15 years removed from the end of his life. Whether you agree or disagree with his policies and conservative outlooks, he was a galvanizing force in American culture that brought thousands of people together. He's the most influential American politician since FDR and has become true north for millions of American conservatives. It's an appropriate legacy for a complex man of many interests. For a political faction that often sings of the limitless potential of America, it's fitting their modern-day icon was a man who seemed to be just about capable of anything. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do smash that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Raycon. Link to them below. And thank you for watching.